I'm going to follow along in your Bible at Isaiah chapter 7 will be our, our first stopping point today in Scripture. Uh, we now turn our attention uh, to the spoken word as we've uh, transitioned from singing songs. Uh, if you notice in these songs, and this is common in most all the songs that we sing, that uh, there's a name that describes our Savior. And this morning, but uh, Nathaniel, if I could... Uh, Trade off with you. Only have one slide. Uh, We're going to continue this idea of words of life and hope. Talk about Jesus, who is our everything. But focus on the names of our Savior. Uh, We live in a world of four-letter words. Uh, In fact, at the beginning of each school year, I have part of one of my early assignments is Uh, Mr. Mulligan's 10 rules for my classroom, and one of those rules is what words you cannot say in the classroom. And uh, I don't spell those words out for them, I just give them the first letter and they can figure it out, Uh, but they just need to know right away that that's unacceptable. Uh, I think this is the first year uh, I've not done it simply because my reputation precedes me and they know that in my class you simply don't. And uh, every once in a while I hear something and they're let known right away that that's just not acceptable at all. And they seem to respect that. But that's the world we live in. Uh, a lot of times before Elise and I go see a movie, I go first to a couple of websites to see what level of profanity is going to be in this movie. And uh, I don't know what my set number is, but I see numbers that there's, whatever this movie is, it's not going to be worth it. And simply decide not to go. Uh, simply because I don't want to be assaulted with that, and especially for a crummy movie. Uh, so just say no. But that's the world we live in. Um, our world does not express itself as well as it used to. Uh, vocabularies are shrinking. So whenever that happens, uh, profane words, uh, words that are crudely used, uh, rise and rise, because that's the easiest way for people to express themselves. And Sadly, many times, names that relate to our Lord and God end up being part of those words that are used in a profane way. We know as one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not use the name of your Lord God in vain. Uh, Israel was told not to invoke the name of God in some careless way. I think the idea of like using it as a curse word wasn't even a thought. It was just, don't use it carelessly. But many words today that describe our God are used not only carelessly, but they're used uh, in a directly opposite way than God intends. Uh, This lesson is not necessarily on that, on profanity and things like that. We'll make some applications in just a moment. But uh, simply the best way to redirect ourselves in our culture is simply try to honor words as they should be honored and make sure that as we respect words, that should be part of a vocabulary. Hopefully those around us we interact with will see that this is a word that should be respected or see that we revere a word or description um, that we have invested everything in. So this morning we're just going to look at some of the descriptions of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, the words that I just used we're going to look at uh, closely, not in some kind of academic sense. That would, again, be not understanding these words correctly, but simply to see how they were used and the distinction between each one and to see that Jesus truly is our everything and then to live accordingly. Uh, Here's the lesson right here. You get to see it ahead of time as we look at it. We're going to just walk through these words, words that describe our Savior. Uh, Some of these words we rarely see in Scripture, but when we do see them, they're uh, very powerful or forcefully used. Uh, We see them perhaps far more in song, uh, but we, others we see quite frequently in Scripture. And we'll try to see the difference between each one. First of all, the word Emmanuel. Uh, usually we don't see that till Christmas songs. Uh, it will show up in some of the older hymns that relate to the birth of Christ, Emmanuel. But this is probably one of the more obscure ones as far as its frequency. But it's the one that begins probably in the earliest place in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the prophet Isaiah is previewing God's work with the nation of Israel. Uh, Before great things will come out of Israel, they will have to go into captivity because they've rebelled against their God. 
As God's children, they've done just the opposite of what they were supposed to do, and they refuse to correct themselves, and they're going to be punished. But yet God will still hold out hope for them, and he continues to point to someone who's coming in their future that will turn this nation around, but not in some kind of physical sense where they'll be armed to be the most powerful uh, militaristic nation, but instead be a spiritual nation. And this is a preview by simply previewing a name that is to come. Isaiah 7, verse 13 and 14. It says, Then Isaiah said, and he's speaking to Israel, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of human beings? Will you try the patience of my God also? Verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Here, even though there might have been some immediate fulfillment coming, the only place we know this is really fulfilled is in the coming of Jesus Christ. If you look ahead to Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, look what's said in the earliest gospel about simply Christ himself. Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 23, Mary is told about uh, the coming birth of her child, and it says in verse 20 of Matthew 1, But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Here in this text, we find not only the meaning of Jesus being given, we'll kind of preview that, uh, he will give, be given the name, verse 21, Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But notice here the word Emmanuel. Uh, going back all the way to Isaiah 7, 14, is a word that was given to simply lay down this truth about this coming Savior, that it is God with us. This God who created mankind, who has sustained mankind, is now seeking to come down from the heavens where he dwells and to be with his creation. And he will save the people from the quicksand of their own sin. He will save them, but he will also be with them. Here God is not only the one who wants to rescue his people, he wants to be around them. Uh, one thing we're told early on as teachers, and a lot of people are in professions where you're dealing with people. Nurses have to learn this. That you're in a, prof a profession that deals with people, and you, if you don't really like people, you probably ought to go into something else. But instead we find here a God who wants to be around people. He doesn't want to just come rescue them and then go back home. It says God with us. God wants to dwell among us, and that's the heart of the meaning Emmanuel. That when Jesus came to this earth and was conceived supernaturally, he lived both as God and as man, but the whole purpose not only is to save us, but to simply be around us. Jesus took on our identity and our humanity. He wanted to see what it felt like to be tempted, not just out of curiosity, but to identify with us. That he knows us, and he knows our struggles. And the scripture describes him, he's our friend. But part of that ability to empathize and understand is simply to be with us. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record Jesus with the people that he created. So when we'll sing in the months to come, Emmanuel, and you'll hear that word uh, in different context, know that it fundamentally means not just a word that's beautiful to say on the lips, but a word that says God lived among us. And one day he's going to call us home to be with him, because that's all God's ever wanted, is for his people to be with him. And one day that will be fully realized again as we live with him forever in heaven. So this word Emmanuel is powerful, even if it's not as well known as the others. Here's one that is more well-known, Messiah. 
Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, Notice how Matthew begins his gospel. Matthew 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, Verse 16 of Matthew uh, 1. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Then verse 17. Matthew 1, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And then we see this elsewhere in Scripture, uh, especially in the beginnings of the Gospels, word Messiah. Again, what's interesting about all these words is they flow beautifully from the lips. They're enjoyable words to sing because of the placement of the vowels, but they're far much more than that. Even though these words have been used and many songs have been written, here this word Messiah has a very specific focus upon there's a promised deliverer coming. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 alluded to that. God's going to be with us. But there's going to be one person that's going to be the answer to that promise. And Jesus is that promised deliverer. Uh, We'll see in a few moments Matthew 16 about When Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And he asked his inner circle. Well, some thought Elijah. And some thought one of the prophets. They were anticipating someone coming. Uh, Someone in the likeness of Moses. They thought of deliverers they had in the past. Uh, The prophets were certainly deliverers with their miraculous power and their powerful words. So they were looking for someone. They could tell in their scripture, they'll tell there's someone coming that God has promised. And what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that someone is Jesus. And he confirms by fulfilling prophecies, he confirms by what he taught, by what he did in miracles, that he is that deliverer, but that deliverer specifically was called the Messiah. That's why you find the gospel, some will say, hey, we have found the Messiah. He is the one, even if they understood deliverer differently, and they thought he was going to be someone that delivered the nation from captivity of Uh, Roman enslavement. Even if they had the wrong idea about exactly what they were being delivered from, they didn't understand that someone is coming to deliver them. And the word Messiah captures that. Look now at Matthew chapter 16. It's what we read earlier. Matthew 16. Here's how high that anticipation uh, was. Verse 13, Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Peter's saying, you're the promised one. We, we know that you're fulfilling what was said that was going to be true about the Messiah and what he would do. But they're understanding that there is a deliverer that is now here on the premises. The premises of their life in the first century. God has come down to his humanity and provided a deliverer. Let's look at the next one, Savior. Look at Philippians 3. There are many places to look, but we're going to look at Philippians 3 because many of them are right here in one text. Philippians chapter 3. Here Paul is talking about the uniqueness of the Philippians. Uh, uh, The Philippians lived in the ancient city of Philippi, which was kind of like a vacation city. It was the area where uh, many Roman generals went to retire. Uh, The citizens of Philippi were generally wealthy. Uh, It's recorded that they lived uh, free of taxation from the Roman Empire, and they were proud of their citizenship. Uh, We live in an area where there's a city of Hillsborough. In fact, they call themselves the town of Hillsborough. It's one of the most affluent areas of the the country, and people that are from Hillsborough uh, usually let you know that within a few sentences of conversation. They're proud of where they live, and they should be. It's a nice area. And people that were from Philippi, thought the same way. But notice what Paul tells them. Verse 20, chapter 3. He says, But our citizenship is in heaven. 
and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Notice in verse 20, first of all, we're citizens of heaven. But then he says, we eagerly await a Savior. The Savior's already come to earth, but here Paul is alluding to the fact that that Savior is going to return. We eagerly await a Savior, and he says, then the Lord Jesus Christ. Invokes here within one verse four descriptions of our Lord and God. First of all, the, sa- the word Savior. This is probably the easiest one that we're probably more familiar with. Uh, here literally means someone who saves us from evil. Uh, we don't need a savior from bad finances. We don't need a, a savior from uh, perhaps getting some kind of disease, perhaps. We, we have doctors. We, we need a savior from our terminal condition of sin. Uh, you can be free of every other physical malady, but we're all still terminal. And if we die in our sins without those sins being addressed, we're doomed. But here Jesus is the Savior, the one who saves us from evil. And that's the first thing that Apostle Paul acknowledges about him in Philippians 3.20. We eagerly await our Savior. Our Savior is returning to take us home. The one who saves us from evil. The word Jesus itself. We'll go to the next one. Uh, Jesus is the current form of the ancient word Joshua, uh, which simply means God saves or Jehovah saves. And if we go back to Matthew chapter 1, remember as Joseph and Mary are being told about the name that's going to be given their son. It's not going to be in the top 20 list of the baby book of that year. It's going to be a name that truly means something powerful. It's going to be Jesus. And they were already familiar with Jesus. Jesus. In the form Joshua. The idea of God saves. It's not that the people are going to save themselves. It's not that they can be good enough and then earn God's uh, favor. It's not that some magic is going to happen with their problem of sin. It's God's going to intervene. And that's the fundamental meaning of the word Jesus. God is going to intervene and to save and rescue his people. The book of Colossians, uh, right next to the book of Philippians. Uh, The Apostle Paul writes of us, he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Again, the idea of rescue runs all throughout the word Jesus, or the name Jesus. He is a rescuer fundamentally. He's a rescuer of people who desperately needed to be rescued. So God saves is behind the word Jesus. The word Christ or the name Christ. It's from the Greek word Christos, which simply means the anointed one. It's very similar to Messiah. Uh, It's the idea that there's one who's been designated is the one to save. Uh, because he's qualified to save. I'm, I think all of us would have the best intentions to save each other. But when it comes to our problem with sin, there's no one that can, simply because we have our own problem with sin, where we all need to be rescued, we all need someone to rescue us. But here the idea of him being the Christ, he is the one who is designated to be the rescuer and is qualified. So it's very similar again to Messiah. Messiah. And when you combine Jesus and Christ together, simply the idea of one rescues, and this is the determined rescuer. You don't want, if you're in the hospital getting ready for surgery, you don't want just anyone with a white coat walking in and saying, hey, I'll I'll do the surgery today. You want the designated doctor. You want the qualified one. And the same is especially true with our spiritual malady of sin. But also Paul invokes here, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is almost the forgotten name or description. 
Uh, we can talk about Jesus and talk about Him being the Christ and the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. But if we will not do <laughs> what He tells us to do, we render all the other names meaningless. Uh, Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Uh, he saved us from our sins, but he did, he did not intend for us to stay in those sins or stay in a lifestyle or stay in a spirit of, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do. You know, it's not really that bad. If it's just what I want to do, it may as well be because we're trying simply to chart our own course. But here Jesus is our Lord. He saved us from darkness so that we might live a different life. We've been brought from death to life. And just as we exalt the name Jesus and Christ, we must exalt the word Lord as well. When we're tempted to go the wrong direction, uh, when we're tempted to be swallowed up by the lifestyle of this world and follow its ideas and its thoughts, its entertainment, its priorities, part of the reason for these services is to always come back that Jesus is Lord. He not only is our Savior, but He's our Lord, and we receive our instructions or our marching orders to do something different. Whether it be in our relationships, which are the most challenging, uh, friendships, marriage, parent-child, we all have our most challenging of relationships. And Jesus is really not Lord of our life till He's Lord of those areas where we find it the most difficult to do the right thing. And that usually is at home first, uh, work second, neighbors third. <laughs> Notice it's the people that we spend the most time with that we have the hardest time with. Think about that again. The people that we spend the most time with, we usually have the hardest time with. But that's where we are to be Lord or have Christ as Lord. Husbands in uh, Ephesians 5 are told to be sacrificial just as Christ was sacrificial. Uh, Jesus will be Lord of our speech, Lord of our priorities. Everything falls under his lordship. So again, Paul says, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lest anyone forget exactly what place Jesus falls in. These are just the primary ones in Scripture. I have planned in a couple of weeks to talk about Jesus being shepherd and, and take on some of the other descriptions that light, of the world, things like that, things that affect us in different ways. But these are the primary identifiers of Jesus that describe his role relationship to us. And I want to end with just two applications about these things. First of all, always use these words respectfully and never profanely. All of us have heard someone combine Jesus and Christ together as some kind of exclamation of anger. That something got messed up on the job and they'll say out Jesus Christ in a very profane, disrespectful way. May that never be our case. If someone says that and they don't even name the name of Jesus Christ, well, that's the world we live in. But don't let it ever be said of you. If you're short on words, if you're short on how to express anger or how to express frustration, there are other words, there are other ways. And you can Google them quite easily. Or if you're just frustrated, just kind of walk away. <laughs> but never resort to using these most precious names as words uh, to be used casually or disrespectfully. OMG has become the most popular thing, and for some reason it won't go away. Oh my. And that's not what is supposed to be what we're about. We are simply people that know how to speak, and especially of our Savior. So whether we're at home, in the privacy of our own walls, or at work, or we're in conversation, make sure that the name of Jesus is honored in all ways as you talk about him. But remember also, these words describe the one who is everything to us. There's absolutely no one in our life that holds any one of these positions let alone all six of them together. We don't have a rescuer outside of Jesus. There's no anointed one. There's no one that has the authority over us. There's no one who is the promised deliverer. And there's certainly no one who is God with us except Jesus Christ. Um, 
These are not just descriptors, but they are positions in our life. And don't let anyone else take one of these positions. Whether it be your spouse, whether it be a friend or a family member, as valuable as they are and as much as you're to respect them within the boundaries God gives to you to respect them and to love them, they don't hold any of these positions. And that's why Jesus taught, whoever loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Don't, don't let anyone else take these positions in your life. Don't be pressured to let someone else be in this role. And part of being faithful to the Lord is you're going to have people that don't like that faithfulness. And they're not going to like always you putting your Lord before them. And your challenge will be to remember these words mean things about things you actually do and the positions you place people in your life. Don't ever let a boss take one of these positions. Don't let a coach don't let a supervisor or a superintendent or a landlord, anyone. Now, those are all positions of some degree of importance, but they're not these. These positions are reserved for one person who's qualified to be in it, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as long as he reigns, your life will be where it should be. Because you know who has done everything for you. And who is everything and who will be everything in your future? No one else has that place. Just a moment, we're going to sing a song to encourage us to keep Jesus in that place. And it is a challenge. Because outside of this assembly, you're not going to really hear the name of Jesus be honored unless it's another spiritual assembly. It's not going to be on the news. It's not going to be in politics anywhere else. So make sure you're seizing the moment of these assemblies and other times of devotion to reassert the position of Jesus. We need to make some changes this morning. If we need to redirect our lives to put Jesus back on the throne because someone else or something else has been there, use this occasion. It's the time for repentance of saying, I will leave this place determining to do differently than I've been doing. Or simply determine, I will maintain this place of Jesus. No other person will ever be there other than him. Whatever commitment you need to make, make sure you make it and leave here stronger.